Greetings, Word Horde. We're here with an exciting option for you, a version of our podcast without any ads. That's right. No advertising interruptions, just the content you love, ready to go in your favorite podcast apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's another way to support the show, ensuring that we keep bringing you the word stories and language explorations that you love. Try it at waywardradio.org slash ad free. And it's affordable. For just a small subscription fee, you can enjoy a way with words uninterrupted, except by us. Plus, it makes a great gift. Know somebody who loves language as much as you do? Give them the gift of words. Easy to sign up, easy to enjoy. It's the same away with words, just streamlined for your listening pleasure. Go to waywardradio.org slash adfree. Support us, support the show, and enjoy an ad-free listening experience. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. A few weeks ago, we had that call from Deborah in Gates, North Carolina, and she was asking about the phrase that her husband used, I don't want to have to lick the cat over. Oh, yes. Remember that? And it means you didn't want to have to do something over or start start again. Right. And it was puzzling, and we really puzzled over it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we gave her a good answer. You don't? I don't. I think there's a second answer. There is a second answer. But I don't know about a better answer. I think it's a better answer. Let's hear it. Well, for me, it was this forehead-smacking moment because we got a a lot of emails like this one from Joy Beard, who said, my husband's an old Tennessee country boy who says he knows the phrase as lick the calf over. Oh, nice. And that's when I started right. pounding my head because, of course, lick the calf over. You know, a little newborn calf mm-hmm. Mama comes, comes over and, and gives it some, yeah, some love, right? Yeah, yeah, well, and she's licking the membrane mm-hmm. off, and it's, and it's a long, involved process. Zora Neale Hurston used it that way, lick the calf over. And I found lots more references to that phrase than lick the cat over. So it's which C-A-L-F I... and not C-A-T. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about this is that both forms exist simultaneously and side mm-hmm. by side and, and have abundant presence out there, right? Well, I, I think the but, calf one is much more abundant and it makes more sense to It me. makes more sense. It certainly does. Yeah. But cats do a lot of licking. Cats so you can do. see why there's a reanalysis. Why somebody yeah. might hear cat instead of calf mm-hmm. and think, mm-hmm. oh yeah, cats do a licking. They're known mm-hmm. for licking. But I was I was so happy that our, our listeners helped us out on that one. That was well, a good one. Well, that's a good moment when you get new facts and our listeners, boy, you guys are field workers out there. Smart bunch. We take what you send us. We use it to make the show. We spin it back out into new content so everyone else can hear it. And we're going to do that now. If you've got something for us that everyone else should hear, give us a call, 877-929-9673. Email us at words at waywardradio.org or find a lot of other ways to reach out to us on our contact page at waywardradio.org. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi. uh, My name is Melanie. I'm calling from San Antonio, Texas. Hello, Melanie. Welcome to the show. What can we do for you? Awesome. Um, I have a question about a pretty common word, but my family has always used it in a different way. Um, It's the word pallet. I'm honestly not sure how they would spell it, but they use it to mean just a bed of blankets on the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, They're both Southern. My mom grew up in Indiana and Arkansas. My dad grew up in Dallas and Houston. And they both grew up using it, and I used it in Florida. But when I moved to Southern California, no one had heard of it at all. I live in San Antonio now, and no one knows it. They look at me like I'm crazy. So a palette came up in your life when and how? It was, um, well, I'd already always used it throughout my life just to say, oh, we're having a sleepover, like, like right. let's make a palette. Yes. But then I read it once in a short story in college. I yeah. wish I had written down the author or something. It was a Southern short story because they said the slave on a well, I it, assume it, it's the same. <laughs> Mark Twain used it in Huck Finn, so you may have encountered it there. Ah. It's not a short story, but that is very Southern, and there are slaves in that book. My experience is the same as yours. I encountered Pallet when the cousins would come over, and we would put a bunch of blankets and pillows together on the floor. We'd yeah. make a Pallet. Or we'd go over to the grandma's house, who didn't really have enough room for everyone. You know, there'd be the kind of family get-togethers, and I kid you not, where somehow I would be assigned to sleep under the table under the feet of the adults who are playing <laughs> cards and drinking above me. <laughs> so it was a kind of I believe it. <laughs> a weird palette on the floor. Um, and it is very Southern. It's Southern, but it's also what you might call the Southern Midwest, what they call the West Midland. So in Missouri, where uh-huh. I'm originally from, it's a very, very well known in parts of the state. 
you find uh, bits and pieces here in Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, but mostly it's the southern states and a little sprinkling here and there. The origin of the term is different than the other palettes that you might, like a painter's palette. It goes oh. back to a French word meaning straw. So if you think mm -hmm. of P-A-I-L-L-E, so if you think of a pile of straw on the floor as a place to make a bed. That actually makes sense. I think the short story I read even said it was a, like a straw palette. Yeah, that, so that, that, yeah wow. that, that makes a lot of sense. So we've kind of moved away from the, We don't have straw in the households much anymore. But yeah. <laughs> No. And I bet a lot of the Southerners probably picked it up from the Bible because there's this story in the book of John about Jesus and an invalid who, who is brought to him and he can't walk. And Jesus says, pick up your pallet and walk after he heals him. Uh -huh. The guy picks it up and well, I'm takes a healer, off. So I don't know that. <laughs> gotcha, I have not read the Bible. <laughs> That's probably why I didn't know that. But that well, how would we spell it, though, in the sense that we use it? Would it be P-A-L-L-E-T? Or... Yeah, exactly. P-A-L-L-E-T. Oh, okay. Yeah, And that E-T is the kind of the the suffix that means to make small or to make cute, like you might have, uh, um, we add E T T E sometimes on a thing to say it's a fact -et. It's a tiny little cute fact instead of a big fact, right? So oh, it's, it's the same. Yeah, e like in Spanish. Ex it. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah, exactly. How the about same. that? So you're That's you're not so alone, cool. and there's millions of people who use this, and are, they're all nodding their heads right now, going, "Yeah, she's right." Thank you, because everyone in Texas, I'm like, "You're in Texas. You should know this." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for calling. Call us again sometime, Melanie. Awesome. Thank you so much. You guys have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Hello. You have a way with words. Hi. Kevin, I'm calling you from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Thanks. What can we do for you? Well, I have a question about laundry. Actually, I have a laundry list of questions about laundry. <laughs> uh, specifically, I know laundry can be a, a noun to describe a building where clothes get laundered, but I'm interested in its use as describing clothes that are about to go to the wash, as in, when does a basket of dirty clothes become the laundry? My wife says to me, grab the basket and take the laundry downstairs, and I say to her, don't you mean take the dirty clothes downstairs? Because they're still clothes until they're being washed. Oh. I see. She calls them laundry the minute they hit the basket. But uh -huh. I say, what if I get up on a cold day like yesterday where it's minus 25 in Calgary and I have to walk the dog and I grab my bunny hug out of the dirty clothes and put it on? Am I putting on laundry? No, I'm putting on clothes. At least that's the way I see it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So... At some point, there's got to be a phase change, is what they call it in science, where it changes from being dirty clothes to being laundry. And oh, my back. gosh. And the magical device is either the laundry machine or the laundry basket, right? Right. And I can't figure out where it becomes laundry. <laughs> to me, it's automatically laundry once it's being laundered. But do you call the basket the laundry basket? Or the clothes basket? No, I call it the clothes basket. Oh, you call it the clothes basket. Does she call it the laundry basket? She alternates back and forth. Oh, she does. Okay. But this as soon as the clothes hit the basket, they're laundry in her mind. I would, uh -huh. I would Indeed. argue, Kevin, that this isn't an either-or situation. That very often the clothes are both laundry and clothes. At what point do they change from being one to the other, though? If I take <laughs> clothes out of the laundry, let's wait. Let's see if we can parse this and break this down. Laundry includes anything that can be laundered, right? So it could be bed clothes or tablecloths mm. or cloth napkins or cleaning rags, right? And so those aren't clothes, uh, but they are laundry. When they're being laundered. Well, is it when they're about when you know they need to be laundered or while they're being laundered or after they're finished being laundered and are now folded and put away? I guess that's the thrust of our discussion, yeah. my wife and I. I mean, it's a question of intent, right? What we really need to do is get a liminal semiotics expert on here <laughs> to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> or a philosopher. <laughs> on the edge of things here where it is completely about intent and it is very little lexical component here, right? It is strictly what is in the mind of the speaker. I think it's strictly what's in the laundry basket because I'm thinking about bedclothes, you know, sheets that are just on the bed and right. you intend to launder them, but they're not laundry until you, you... The magical moment is when you put them in the laundry basket. Let me ask the opposite. You've just finished laundry, yeah. you've folded everything, yeah. and you've put it on somebody's bed for them right. to put away themselves. Right. It's no longer in the laundry Ooh. basket. It's folded. Yeah. It's clothes. 
that hasn't been put in the dresser well, yet is that laundry? There also is another part of our discussion. My wife considers it laundry until it's in the drawer or on a hanger. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So oh. if I fold up the clothes and put them on the end of the bed and then I put them back on, she says, I'm putting back the, putting the laundry back on, not putting oh. clothes on. <laughs> oh, I would say that if if the sheets are folded, then they're the sheets or the clothes. I wouldn't say so it's the laundry. So you're saying yet. if I strip the bed, but yeah. all the sheets and quilts and blankets are still piled in the middle, yeah. they're not yet laundry. I haven't taken them right. to the laundry room. I haven't put them in the laundry basket. Right. We all know that they're going to become laundry. Right. The bed isn't made anymore. Right. But it's not laundry. Right. In, wow. In my, I, you're my so messed up. In my, That's head, messed in up. my <laughs> head, you answered it when you said they're going to become laundry. Yeah. I was trying to get into inside this real defective way of thinking that the two of you have. I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> hey, at least we're doing our laundry. <laughs> no, for me, for me um, you can both be right, even though you call it different things. Like, you can literally be looking at the same basket with the same items in it, and it can both be laundry and clothes. Schrodinger's cat kind of thing. Why Schrodinger's not? laundry. Yeah. Right, Schrodinger's laundry. Why not? <laughs> the other thing, the other question that I have is, is there laundry on the line? No pun intended. Do, oh. Are you arguing about this to such a degree that the loser has to do more laundry? No. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. That's already been decided. Because I, I, I love that. The, I, love I do most that of the watching. She does most of the folding. Okay, that's a fair. Yeah, <laughs> we, we mix it up in our house. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I recently accidentally threw my phone into the washing machine with the clothes. Oh, no. And oh, no. <laughs> I looked in, and there was this little light. Oh, no. This brave little light in the washing machine. And I'm trying to think what I... I threw it... I you Then I threw it in with the clothes. I didn't... I wouldn't say I threw it in with the laundry. Interesting. But it was, yeah. It was being it laundered, was pre- though. <laughs> uh, interesting, I pulled the people that I work with here. Yeah. We all spend our living working with news because I work in, a, or with words because I mm. work in a newsroom. And uh, opinion was split about 50-50 on it. So I think probably there is some middle ground where both people can be right. In the oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I think as long as that basket gets emptied in a timely way so yeah. you can wear what you want to wear, it doesn't matter. <laughs> And Kevin, we Fair can enough. leave you with another fun word, sniferentiate. You can, might be able to guess what that is. <laughs> when you pull your That's bunny hug out of the word. basket, you sniferentiate yeah, like, it to figure out whether or not you can still wear it. I can wear it one more time. Snifferentiation, yep. yeah. For okay. our American <laughs> listeners, do you want to tell everyone what a bunny hug is? Because they're all going, what? Oh, I think the British call it a kangaroo jacket, and in the States, you might call it a hoodie. Yeah, yep, exactly. A hoodie. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a sweater with a where you can put your hands in the front to keep them warm. Or a sweatshirt, as most Americans would call it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for your call. You know, we're going to get so much email about this. Yeah. I'm going to have to put a filter on the mail just to yeah. route it to another folder. Because it's <laughs> it's going to be so it much. It's a pleasure talking to you. You've Always unleashed the hounds of language, my friend. <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks for calling, Kevin. If we figure this out, we'll get we'll let you know, all right? I appreciate it. Thanks, right, Kevin. Care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Schrodinger's laundry. I like that. <laughs> when is it laundry? When is it clothing? Is it sometimes both? Is it sometimes neither? 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. This show is about language examined through family, history, and culture. Stay with us. Hey, we've got something special for those of you who love our show but could do without the ads. That's right. Imagine away with words, the same engaging conversations, the same deep dives into language without advertising interruptions. We're talking about our ad-free podcast feed. It's sleek, clean, and it's just for our supporters. It's at waywardradio.org slash ad-free. It's inexpensive, easy to sign up for, and works with all major podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. 
It's an affordable way to support the show and get a seamless listening experience. And if you're feeling generous, why not give a subscription to another Away With Words fan? That's waywardradio.org slash adfree. Sign up today. Your support means the world. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. And joining us now is our quiz guy, John Chinesky. Hi, John. Oh, hi, Martha. Hi, Grant. Hey, bud. What's um, up? You know, yeah, I'm, I, I don't want, you know, I might sound a little paranoid, a little crazy or something, but I'm convinced that there are people trying to sneak into my house. They've been gaining entry <laughs> by hiding inside stuff that I've ordered online. And for, for example, here's a delivery at my door right now. Yeah. Now, this is a nice piece of jewelry I ordered for my wife to wear around her neck. And, and there, there's some guy named Dan in this pendant. Oh, uh, I get yeah, it. I'm, I'm, I, yeah. So Dan is now, in the pendant. We're finding words pendant. and words. Names yeah. and words? Finding people? Names and words. They can't get past me. I mean us. We'll, we'll do this together. I'll <laughs> okay, describe great. the item I ordered. You tell me if you can determine who is sneaking into my house. Okay, okay. don't worry, right. John. Now, note. All of these sneaks trying to get into my house, they have three-letter names, and they're always hiding inside, never at the beginning or the end, all right? Okay. Here's the first one. It's a quickly flashing light for my 70s-themed basement discotheque. Seems pretty harmless. Is anybody in there? For Rob. Your... Ooh, Rob's in there. Oh, oh how the dare you. Yes, gotcha. Rob mm-hmm. is in the strobe. Oh, oh, what a guy. I was thinking oh, about yeah. Lynn in the blink blinker. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Not like sure. well. <laughs> I ordered this detection system that uses electromagnetic waves to find storms or airplanes or other motor vehicles traveling near my house. Now, is anybody in there? Is Ada in um, the radar? Ada's in the radar. Oh, man. I think some, somebody is in all of these, I think. I think. Oh, good. Uh, my lawn has been looking a little, well, frankly, crappy lately, so I ordered a big bag of a substance used to provide nutrients to my grass. Now... Is anybody in that bag? Is Anu in the manure? Anu in the manure. Ooh. Anu garg, like the word of day guy, yeah. right? That's, that's pretty good, but uh, there's another word on the bag, that uh, a longer word. Mm, fertilizer. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Who is in the fertilizer? Is somebody? Liza. Is Liza in the fertilizer? No, remember? <laughs> Liz. Is Three Liz letters. in the fertilizer? <laughs> Liz. Liz is in the fertilizer. Get out of there, Liz. Oh, this will be fun. I saw that movie, Crazy Rich Asians, and I decided to start playing that traditional rummy-style game that uses tiles, so I ordered one of those. Is anybody in there? Is it Mahjong? John, is John in the Mahjong? John, John oh, is in there. J-O-N. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's sort of a Jonathan guy. Yeah, I'm a J-O-H-N myself, but that's, yeah. Finally, uh, this should help. I've ordered a radio to keep track of local police activity. This way, if there's any nefarious dudes being chased out there, I can tell if they're coming towards my house. Unless... They're already here. Is somebody in there? Anne's in there. Anne's in the scanner. Anne is in my my scanner. What what is the point? How can I keep these people out of my house if there's somebody in everything? This is terrible. All right, you guys, I got to go lie down or something. You guys are great. Take care. (laughs) Bye. And if you'd like to talk with us about language, call us 877-929-9673 or share your stories about words. The address is words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Karen speaking from South Lake, Texas. Hi, Karen. Welcome to the show. What's up? Yes, um, my word is toeheads. When I was growing up, my grandmother used to call my brothers and I, we were all light haired and light eyed uh, toeheads. And then when I heard my first kid, I hadn't heard that term in a long time. And then my mother said it again to me. So I asked her, you know, where did you get that word? And she said, well, my grandmother called you three kids toeheads. So I've always wondered you know, where it came from. And I've asked people, you know, I've lived all over the country and I've always asked people if they'd ever heard of that word. And I haven't gotten a positive response. Wait, you're saying lots of other people haven't heard this term? Uh, Not in some of the places I've lived. Um, Right now I live in South Lake, Texas. And um, no one around here has heard of it. I've in Florida, no one no one had heard of that word. So I am surprised. Color me surprised because I thought it was more common than that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, me too. Not sure why. You're not picturing like a toe, like T O E, right? Like a toe head. No. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. I mean, I my mom again told me it had to do with light hair. That's um, right. Yeah. That we all had blonde hair and blue eyes, but you know, her family was uh, Irish, English, and Scottish, so. 
I was thinking it came from my grandmother somehow. Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's a fairly common term. Toe is an old word. T O W. Uh, toe is an old term for flax. You know the. F- fibers from flax that look pretty much like that same color and uh, blonde same whiteness, texture right? yeah yeah blonde 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 um and and as you said white are your eyebrows kind of white yes mm-hmm. <laughs> they yeah. used to fill them in for pictures <laughs> Well, that's that's very interesting because yes, toe is is a term for the the filament from flax, and uh, so toe headed has been around for a very long time. Sometimes toe headed also means tousled. You know, like like uh, you wake up and you have bedhead and your your hair is all messed up. That can be toe headed too. But usually, it refers to somebody with exactly the kind of of fine, very bright. Uh, white blonde hair that you have. The literary synonym is flaxen haired. Mm-hmm. So, did that come over from England, or was that something that was, you know, started in America? Well, toe meaning flax. So, what's that's back as old as English itself, almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a very old term. And then to- calling people toe headed is goes is at least two hundred years in American English, and probably older than that mm-hmm. in the UK varieties of English. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you're saying that it is commonly used, and maybe I just talk to people who haven't really used that term before. Yeah. I, I haven't heard it commonly used. Yeah, I think, Karen, I think that you'll find that you'll get a lot of, if you keep asking, you'll get more people that know it. Um, maybe my understanding of the frequency of it is a little mis- misplaced because I work in language, and so it just seems common to me. And I, it's something I encountered all the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Right. And again, it's not like I ask everybody all the time. It's just it comes <laughs> up in conversation. Uh, here comes like, Karen. Oh, ever- here comes Karen with her question well, again. <laughs> <laughs> right. She's got well, the T-shirt I really on. appreciate this. Sure. We're glad to help, Karen. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673 is the number to call to talk with us about language or send an email to words at waywardradio.org. And if you just can't wait, find us on Twitter at Wayward. A couple of weeks ago on this show, I dropped some etymology about the term jejun. You remember this, the term jejun meaning simplistic or superficial yeah, or mm-hmm. dry and uninteresting. And I was talking about how it comes from the Latin jejunus, which means fasting or empty or barren, mm-hmm. something like that. And uh, I talked about how it was related to the term jejunum, which is the part of your small intestine, which is usually empty on autopsy. Right. That's what I was thinking of when yeah. you say the word, said the word. Yes. Yeah. But there were a couple of things that I forgot to talk about that will make perfect sense if you think about it. How about the French word for breakfast? Déjeuner? Yes, same idea. Uh, it's like break fast in English, to bre- to breakfast. Oh, gotcha. Very Déjeuner. Good. And uh, the same idea is in the Spanish word for breakfast, desayuno. They all come from that same root, meaning empty. Oh, how about that? How cool, right? I did right? not know that. Yeah, that's cool. 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello. This is Dave. I'm calling from Council Bluffs, Iowa. Council Bluffs, Iowa. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. What can we do for you? When I was a young man, say uh, uh, pre-10, my aunt and uncle used to take me to a bakery um, in Cleveland, Ohio, called Huff's Bakery. And uh, by the way, that's where my whole family came from. And one of the most favorite things that, uh, that I would get at that bakery is something called a lady lock. And... I devoured those very readily and always asked for more. Uh, now I'm 71 years old. I'm out here in Iowa, and when we first moved this direction, I went down to the bakery, and I asked the baker if they had lady locks, and they said they'd never heard of such a thing. <laughs> and as I looked in their case, I saw something that somewhat resembled a lady lock, except it was about half the size. And I said, well, that's a lady lock there. And they said, no, no, it's a cream horn. Cream horn. Now, yeah. uh, as far as I'm concerned, the Lady Lock folks at Huff Bakeries uh, have the edge on this, and uh, they're Lady Locks. They're not Cream Horns. So I'd like to have that battle solved. Uh, let me, mm. Let's just get some clarification here. So Lady Lock were two words, L-A-D-Y-L-O-C-K, right? Yes, sir. And describe what it looks like. How did you recognize it in the baker's cabinet? It's uh, shaped kind of like a horn, where they probably got the Cream Horn. It's a puff pastry done in a swirl, 
and there would be a cream filling inside. It would be sprinkled with a rough uh, sugar crystals on the outside of it. Okay, that mm-hmm. sounds wonderful. I'll be mm-hmm. back in a minute. I'm going to get some of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're wondering why they're called Lady Locks? Well, no, I, uh, I believe they are called Lady Locks because they look like a Lady Lock. You mean like uh, a lock of what? A lock of ladies' hair? Like a lock of ladies' hair. That's right. Kind of swirly or spooly. Uh huh. So your question is, what's wrong with Iowa? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I have to tell you, when I was growing up, I knew these as cream horns for sure. Did you, Grant? I didn't know these at all. I didn't know them really at all. Oh, you didn't? No. Okay. But I understand there's a lot of other terms for this. There's other terms? Yeah, there are lots of other terms, and they all refer to how these things are made. Some people call them clothespin cookies. Oh. Some people call them foam rollers. Wait, clothespin cookies is something else. But okay, we'll get that back to that in a minute. For the foam well, rollers? Well, lots lots of different names for okay. these kinds of things. But yeah, the, they're called lady locks because of how they're made. Because you, you roll out the dough, mm-hmm. and then you cut it into strips, and then you roll the strips around something, whether it's a clothespin covered with uh, aluminum foil or some kind of specially made roller. You roll the, them around, mm-hmm. and they're called lady locks, so you like cook locks them, of hair. You cook them rolled around, and they puff up and form yep. like this cornucopia-looking thing, right? Mm-hmm. And then you jam the filling into mm-hmm. that opening after you remove the the roller or whatever is inside. Mm-hmm. Okay. And another version of this is an Austrian specialty called Schillerlocken, which uh, refers to the 19th century poet Schiller, Friedrich Schiller, who had locks of hair like that. There's a famous portrait of him, and it looks like he's got lady locks on the side of his head, if you can picture <laughs> that. And so they, they call it um, in honor of the poet oh, who cool. had this wild-looking hair. Is it, any of this ringing a bell for you? No. Uh, the only one that uh, rings a bell with me is Lady Locks. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I kind of feel like uh, our Huff Bakery in Cleveland has the, uh, <laughs> has the uh, exclusive uh, uh, right to the word. Uh, it seems to me their bakery started in the very early 1900s. Oh, well, the term is older than that, just so you know. It goes at least back to the early 18, or, I'm sorry, the 1880s. Well, maybe they got me on that but, one. So what was inside of yours? So cream can go in there, whipped cream, or, or what are we talking about, custard or jelly filling? What was in yours? Dave? Well, it, it wasn't a frosting, uh, and it wasn't necessarily a whipped cream. It was a consistency somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, gotcha. And, uh, of course, that's what, as kids, that's what we wanted more than anything was the cream that was inside. Well, Dave, thank you so much for sharing these sweet memories. I'm sure you've uh, brought back a lot of good ones for people I, who I miss Lady them dearly. <laughs> I miss them dearly. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Take right. care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. across a couple of references to peak and plum towns. Do you know what this means? Peak and plum towns. Mm-hmm. Is this P-E-E-K? Yes, P-E-E-K. And P-L-U-M? Right. Are these towns with great leaf peeping in the fall? <laughs> Good fruit harvest? Well, they might be. Might be. Uh, a peak and plum town is a really small town. And I've seen it explained a couple of different ways. A peak and plum town is when you take a peek around the corner, and you're plumb out of town. <laughs> <laughs> or you're driving through the town and you just take one peek and you're plumb out of town. <laughs> <You're> plum done. <laughs> peak and plumb town. But that's a different plum. The plumb out of town is with a B in the end, P L U M B, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess technically, but uh, But it's funnier slang just to term, say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> peak and plum, little bitty town. Hit us up, 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Andrea calling from San Diego, California. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the show. Hi. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank you. What is up? So I had a question for you. Um, I was driving around in the in the neighborhood, and I saw a restaurant, and I noticed something that marketing people seem to do, and that's where they take a word that you know, and then they change the spelling of it to uh, define like a new product or a new service. Um, and this happens all the time, but I saw this restaurant called uh, Curiosity. Which was a which is a curry place, but based off of the word Q 
curiosity. <laughs> so I, I, this happens a lot in marketing, and my question was, is there a term for this activity that marketers do? Because it's, since it's been around for so long, I thought there might be a way that that's defined. Well, yeah, it's just they're literally creating new words. It's onomastics, which is the is the study oh. of study of language and new words. And there are companies out there, many of them, that you can hire to help you name your product or name your business. And so it's naming. It's just the naming business. Yeah. Oh wow, onomastic. Oh, onomastic. Yeah, is the study of of words that are names, um, any kind of name, not just company names, but people name or thing names. Yeah, and if you want to do some reading about this, there's a great blog by our friend Nancy Friedman called Frida Nancy, F-R-I-T-I-N-A-N-C-Y, which the the name means the chirping of crickets, actually. And, but she and comments she work, on... She works in the field, right? Yes, yeah, she she comes up with names. She's a professional namer, and she's she's got some great insights about these kinds of things. I learned on her blog that uh, a few years ago, uh, Downey, the people who make the fabric softener, released this product called Unstoppables, but it only had one P in it. So it looks like Unstoppables, oh. but they yeah. got challenged by that. And uh, they responded, their PR people responded, that uh, the name was actually designed to embody the playful and feisty spirit of the new product's unique form. The name puts a spin on the word unstoppable, similar to how unstoppables, or unstoppables, put a new twist on your laundry. Now, whether you believe that or not, <laughs> I, don't. Wow. I think maybe they were just covering their tails. I don't know. <laughs> Andrea, one of the reasons that they do this is they want to own a word. They want it to be theirs right. and they don't don't have to pay to say buy the domain name or they don't have to compete with others for the identities that might be associated so they come up with new words i worked in advertising for a long time and there's a particular kind of copywriter who loves to do this and just mess with language because they think it's creative and they don't realize that a lot of their customers are getting stuck on this creativity and air quotes there. And really, it's it's confusing and diluting their message. Well, I'm glad you were both able to clarify that because <laughs> I did not think there was a word for it. I thought there should be. Yeah. But there's no way I would have guessed onomastic. Well, that's the study of names. But naming, they just literally call it naming in the business. They mm -hmm. might have their own custom okay. terms for it. But it's something that businesses do all the time um, for public-facing words anyway. Andrea, did you find it effective? Do you, do you like that kind of thing, or do you, th do you find it off-putting? Um, I like it. And, you know, I mean, this particular use of the, the naming of this restaurant uh, triggered me enough to email you guys. So, <laughs> I thought yeah. you were going to say go there. It in my mind some... <laughs> for several weeks. <laughs> so you haven't gone there to have curry yet? <laughs> Not yet, but I think I should now. <laughs> yeah, go satisfy your curiosity. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. We'll talk to you again sometime. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. All righty. Bye-bye. Share your stories about the workplace, 877-929-9673, or send them to us in email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Remember our conversation about traveling across the international dateline and either yeah. losing a day? Is there a or word for losing the day? day, right? Right. And I don't think we ever really came up with one. No. But it reminded Jacqueline Lambert of Ishpeming, Michigan, of the term Beatles Week. Beatles Week? Like yeah. the Beatle is the bug? No, the Beatles like like John Paul, the George, rock and band. Ringo. Yeah. She says that when she and her oh, friends right. are talking about something that takes really long, they'll say, oh, it's longer than a Beatles week. Or, or if they're casually mentioning something that's nine days away, they'll say, oh, that's longer than a Beatles week. Eight days a week. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. A Beatles week. All right. Sing the rest of it. Now. 877-929-9673. <laughs> Got a minute? We need your help. Head over to gum.fm slash words and share your thoughts in our quick survey. Your feedback matters. It's the backbone of our show's success. Thanks for making our show even more successful. That's gum.fm slash w-o-r-d-s. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. 
I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. In 1854, a bright young Englishman who went by the name Robert John went off to Oxford University. Now, he was something of a prodigy. He taught himself to read at three, and he was a very promising student. But he soon received letters from a relative begging him to come home and take over management of the family estate in southwestern England. And when I say estate, I mean estate, because this was Kinnersley Castle, which is on the border with Wales, and it's this huge medieval structure. But he didn't want to do that. And so instead, he ran off to see the world. He went to Australia. He went to Tasmania. And then he was shipwrecked off the coast of New Zealand. And he was rescued by some of the Maori people who lived there. And so he ended up living with them for a couple of years. And eventually he made his way to Trinidad, and he was really passionate about paleontology and biology and also education, so much so that he eventually became the first superintendent of public education there in Trinidad. He was fascinated by fish there in the tropics, and in particular a fish that was known as the rainbow fish or the million fish. This was a little bitty, tiny, tiny fish, and they called them million fishes because there were so many of them in one school. And so he gathered some samples of that and sent them off to the British Museum, and uh, they were so impressed with his work that they named this little fish after Robert John, whose full name was Robert John Lechmere Guppy. Oh, how cool is how that? How cool is that? Right? Wait, his last name was Guppy? Guppy. <laughs> when you said his name was Robert John earlier, I was like, I don't know anything called the Robert John. <laughs> the John. The is this John. Be the he, origin of the yeah, toilet. It, the Robert Earl. Yeah. But the, they named the Guppy after this guy. After I did not Mr. know. Guppy. How about that? Yeah. And I think probably, as is often the case, somebody else had found this fish and written it up, but he's the one who got the right. credit for it. Right. It's often the case. The, yeah. The the coiner or the originator often doesn't get the glory. Yeah. Well, that's the story of guppies. There's lots of crazy stuff happening in language. It's happening in your home. It's happening where you work. It's happening in the books you read and stuff you read on the Internet. Share it with us. Ask questions. Tell us what you know. 877-929-9673. Or email words at waywardradio.org. And you can find a dozen ways to contact us on our website at waywardradio.org slash contact. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi. Uh, this is Pat. I'm calling from Aubrey, Texas. Well, welcome to the show, Pat. What can we do for you? I have been wondering about an expression my mother used when I was a kid. And um, she would say this whenever adults were talking about adult things, and I might happen to be in the room, and she would say to her friends, be careful Little pitchers have big ears. Mm -hmm. So I always knew what it meant. You know, I always knew it meant, okay, everybody, don't talk about this, you know, sister's listening, Patty's listening. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my little mind, I would think, okay, what is she talking about? Um, The women, the people in my family pronounce pitcher like a pitcher of water. They pronounce it the same way as picture like a picture of something Mm -hmm. and so I would try to think well is it a water pitcher with big ears or it is a picture of me with big ears (laughs) so I don't know which it was and I don't know what in the heck (laughs) expression does that mean (laughs) when you heard it you knew that things could not be discussed in front of the kids right right so I did know that it meant that just don't know where it comes from, if anybody else says that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Lots of uh, say for, it. <laughs> for centuries, well back into the 1500s, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, a, it's widespread, and it has to do with the, the visual of a pitcher. Like, you might put water in, and it's got this big handle, the shape roughly of a human ear. And it's okay. a comparison of the big ear on the pitcher to the big ears on the kids, meaning the kids are listening very carefully because even my son does. I did this when I was a kid. I would always listen. I would listen at the heater vents. Just to, <laughs> oh, <you> would? <laughs> I would, absolutely. <laughs> Mom, sorry if you're listening. <laughs> you're kicking it out. But yeah, because this is how we learn about the adult world by listening to the adults and figuring things out from what they let slip. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so yeah, imagine a pitcher with a big handle, roughly the shape of a human ear. Now, some people... When they hear this and they know that it's meant the pouring, you know, the pouring receptacle, 
Um, right. They think of the emptiness of the pitcher, and they think of it as just waiting to be filled up with something that will later be poured out again. Mm-hmm. And that's the oh. second part of it, the idea that the kids aren't only hearing with their big ears, but they're going to pour it back out <laughs> later to somebody it's else's ear. Back. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're going to... They're going to tell their cousins the next yeah. time they're with the family. Yeah, exactly. so that is a children hearing things is not a dead end. There is a loop there. It moves forward and goes on. That's right. That's how you learn secret stuff. It's also how you learn to spell. I remember my mother used to ask my older brothers if they wanted some C A K E, and I would say I want some C K K because I knew it was something good, whatever it was. And they were not going to let little Martha Ann have any. What? <laughs> Uh, Pat, okay. I got to tell you, there's another expression which we don't use much anymore, but you can find it in collections of sayings and proverbs and the like. And it's great talkers are like broken pitchers; everything runs out of them. Ooh. And again, it's the idea of this receptacle that just can't hold a thing in, mm-hmm. can't do the job of keeping something in that it should be keeping in. So there you go. Yeah, thank you for that. I love it. It's the mystery is solved. Th- thanks for calling, That's Pat. It. Call us again sometime. Oh. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Glad to help. Bye-bye. There's an Australian variant, Little Rabbits Have Big Ears. Oh. <laughs> which is <laughs> evocative, cute. right? Uh-huh. But it doesn't have that extra little something about what goes in also comes out. Yeah, it's, it's a whole different idea, isn't it? Yeah. Just these really cute little things that also happen to have <laughs> these, <laughs> these ears that the hear wolf radar everything. wolf radar or whatever. <laughs> right? <laughs> Call us with your language question, 877-929-9673, or send your emails to words at waywardradio.org. Grant, you know how much I love coffee, and I have a new way of talking about coffee. Some people use the term build to mean prepare. Have you heard this? No, I haven't. I don't hang around with people like that. (laughs) Well, you hang out with me, and I'm going to start saying I'm going to go build some coffee. I really like this notion. What does this mean? Well, I looked it up in the Dictionary of American Regional English because I I heard somebody talking about building some coffee. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that build is an old term that means to prepare something to eat or drink. So you might talk about building lemon pie or building an angel food cake. And some people around the country still say, uh, I'm going to go build some coffee. Oh, so it's not some pretentious hipster term. It's an no. old-fashioned thing. Gotcha. No, no. Okay. It's it's very old, and I saw it in a lot of uh, literature of the Old West, right. too. It's It seems to be more common in hmm. the West. But... I'm thinking about those old percolators where there was a certain amount of building mm-hmm. of coffee, where you had yeah. to assemble the device, right. even more complicated than a French press, right? And, yep. and get the coffee in the right, right place, make sure it didn't get under it, mm-hmm. so you didn't, have, you didn't have coffee grounds yeah. in the liquid. And yeah, and then so it forth. perks. And then it perks, yeah. Up at the little clear glass knob at yeah. the top that the bubbles go up into. Yeah, and the ritual of preparing it is almost as much fun as drinking it. But, <laughs> but I, I've started to say that. I'm going to go build some coffee. Nice. Or or usually more plaintively, will you go build me some coffee? <laughs> <laughs> I, see. I see how that is. Hit us up. We take your questions anywhere, anytime. 877 877- 929-9673 or email words at waywardradio.org or go to our contact page on the website at waywardradio.org and find a dozen other ways to reach us. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, Martha and Grant. How are you today? This is John Sieben from Seguin, Texas. Hi, John. Welcome to the show. Well, I've got a question that uh, dates back to something I heard 60 years ago or more. In cold weather, my mother would say, it is colder than a well digger's, and she didn't finish that the way most people would think. She would say something like clavicle or clavicle, and I I don't really remember exactly how she pronounced that. That's close. Don't know how to spell it, and uh, I never asked her what it meant, but I knew what the whole expression meant. It meant wear layers. Wear layers. <laughs> yeah. Wear layers. So it's super cold outside, and she's making a comment, and she says it's colder than a well digger's, and it sounds like clavicle? Right. And do you think she meant the bone, the bone that's kind of at your shoulder? I No. I, I mean, I rather doubt that. Hmm. So I thought this was probably something she was substituting for a well digger's 
rear end, to be oh. gentle about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, there is, because the standard expression is colder than a well digger's rear end, only they're usually, usually it's a crasser term than rear end, right? Correct. Although, um, if you dig around, no pun intended, you'll dig around, you'll find <laughs> the reason I think she might actually have been saying clavicle, I, I don't know of any examples of that, but some people have said colder than a well digger's knee or colder than a well digger's belt buckle or colder than a well digger's elbow. So there are other kind of things on the body that have been used in this way. Mm-hmm. I just can't imagine where she would have picked that up. Well, maybe she was a just had a good ear for language. Sometimes people, you know, read it in the newspaper or something or heard it on the radio. Yeah, or maybe she just wanted to mess with people's expectations, <laughs> that they were expecting the naughty thing, and then she just throws in an anatomical term, clavicle. <laughs> She, she would have enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice mix of registers, which is something that I always appreciate when the low and the high meet in slang. Right. Sometimes people will add on the end of that colder than a well digger's behind in the Yukon or the Klondike, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, or January. Well, this was in rural Kansas, and so I, I don't know if it was a regional thing. Yeah, well, if another listener knows about that, we'd love to hear about it. Maybe somebody else used that term. Yeah, maybe somebody else has heard a word that sounds like clavicle but isn't clavicle. Colder than a well digger's something. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Yeah, not, I'm not sure we'll bum, hear about not it. Not rear end, not derriere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you know one, call us, 877-929-9673, or send it to us in email, words at waywardradio.org. Well, thank you very much for considering my question. I, I certainly enjoy your show. Thank you, John. We really appreciate your call. Good day. All right, take okay. care. Stay Bye-bye. warm. By the way, the expression is probably older than the 1940s, but that's the earliest that I know of it. Yeah. Colder than a well digger. So of course, there are oh, wow. so many expressions about that. colder than yeah. an X is Y. And this y. or that. Yeah. And a lot of them are naughty, and we can't say them on yeah. the air or won't say them on the air. But. Yeah. I wonder if it was clavicle. And of course, I have to talk about the origin of clavicle, okay. which, which comes from a Latin <laughs> word that means little key. Aww. And you might think, well, why would your collarbone, that's, that's your collarbone, right. it doesn't really look like a key, but it looks like the kind kind of key that was used in ancient Greece with doors. It's, it's more elongated and subtle like that, like the clavicle in your, in so your shoulder. little key is the clavicle. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, there's a that? beautiful passage in the Odyssey where somebody closes a door and locks it with a clavicle. Oh, interesting. 877-929-9673. We were talking about the term pallet, meaning uh, like bedding. An informal bed that you put on the floor. Yeah, it's yeah. And you mentioned and pillows. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned how it came from a French word for straw. Yeah, P A I L L E with a diminutive uh, suffix that yes. makes it like kind of a small, cute yeah, straw or something. Yeah. yeah. I was reminded of the fact that the word for straw in Spanish is paja, related to that. Oh. And uh, in uh, Italian, it's palia. Like Camille Paglia, the writer. P A G L I A. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the opera Pagliacci, which is about a clown. And the traditional Italian character's outfit for a clown was made out of the same fabric that they used to cover straw mattresses. Uh, how cool how, is that? So, all these connections. Yeah, right. all these connections. Wow, hiding there cool. in plain sight. Yeah, hiding there in plain sight. <laughs> Gotta love it. Well, we're easy to find. Go to the website at waywardradio.org slash contact. And you'll find a dozen ways to reach us. Or you can call us 877. 877- 9-6-7-3. Hello, welcome to Away with Words. Hi, this is Claire McCullough. Hi, Claire, where are you calling from? Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, right. wel- welcome to the show. Thank you. What can we help you with? I'm looking for the origin of the saying, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. And I've heard that it's a Shakespearean reference connected to the rope beds people use during that time. But then I've also heard that that's not true. So I'm wondering what the real origin is. Oh, your skepticism is well placed. So the story, <laughs> the story that you heard about Shakespearean times was what? That the beds used, the rope beds that they used, people at night would have to pull the ropes really tight to have support to sleep on. And then that would keep them off the floor so that the bugs wouldn't get them. Mm-hmm. And so you're thinking that that sounds a little too neat, a little too good to be true, right? It does. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're right about that. For a long time, sleep tight has just meant sleep soundly, sleep really, really well. 
Uh, the bed bug saying has lots of different forms. It involves sometimes mosquitoes or fleas. It's not just bed bugs. I grew up with the uh, with the phrase "Good night, sleep tight, wake up in the morning bright, do what's right with all your might." And don't let the bed bugs bite. No, oh, the whole thing. Yeah. The whole wow. Yeah. <laughs> and that one goes all the way back to the 1860s. And so there are just lots of different versions of this, just, just wishing somebody that they'll have a good night's sleep. Especially children, right? Just yeah. the kind of thing you say. It's kind of like the final thing I'm going to say to you before you need to shut your eyes and we're not going to talk about this yeah. anymore. No more getting up for water. <laughs> yeah. And so and so, pretty much the sleep tight is a good rhyme with all those other terms like bed bugs bite and night, night and, and right yeah. and light. Ah. The sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite is firmly a kind of set rhyming phrase by what Martha 1880s. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And then as early as the 1900s, it starts to pop up in exterminator ads. <laughs> so it's a, it's so set that you can like you can just throw it into a small classified ad, and everyone kind of gets the reference. It's not really a mystery anymore. Yeah. Did you grow up hearing it, or you say it to other people? I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I grew up hearing it, and then I'm a third grade teacher, and I told my students this morning that I was going to talk to you. Oh. So they were curious as well because they have also heard the saying. And they've heard the version that you told us, which is a, what again? Sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. That's all. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just a sweet little rhyme. It doesn't have to do with with uh, bedding. I mean, people did sleep on beds that yeah. the ropes were held, uh, strapped around the frame, and they held the mattresses in place, yes. And possibly the ropes sometimes became slack, yes. But the phrase does not come from tightening those ropes. The bed bugs, by the way, don't need the ropes. They climb up the post on each corner of the bed in order to get in the bedding. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank All you right. very much for your call, Claire. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks for your work with the third graders. Yeah, we like teachers. Yeah. You're, our, you're our people. <laughs> well, thank you. Take care. Okay, thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Bye. Is there a saying you're curious about? You can always call us and talk with us about it, 877-929-9673, or send those emails to words at waywardradio.org. We got a call from David who said when he was much younger, he had a science teacher who had a sign on the wall that was intended to keep the students quiet. And the sign simply said laboratory, but by that he put more of the first five, less of the last seven. (laughs) (laughs) So more of the first five letters, which are labor, and less of the last seven, which is oratory. (laughs) Laboratory. (laughs) Very clever. (laughs) 877-929-9673 or email words at waywardradio.org. Thanks to senior producer Stephanie Levine, director Colin Tedeschi, editor Tim Felton, and production assistant Tamar Wittenberg. You can send us a message, subscribe to the podcast, get the newsletter, or catch up on hundreds of past episodes at waywardradio.org. Our toll-free line is always open in the U.S. and Canada, 877-929-9673. Or send us your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. We're coming to you from the Recording Arts Center at Studio West in San Diego, California. Thanks for listening. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Hey, listeners, we have a favor to ask. We'd love for you to fill out our listener survey at gum.fm slash words. Your feedback is crucial. It's quick, and it helps us make our show even better. It shapes our show, helps us plan, and ensures we're bringing you the content you love. That's gum.fm slash words. Thanks for being a part of what we do. Thank you.